Many thanks indeed, and very warm welcome to all the colleagues on this important uh, panel organized by the Portuguese Presidency of the Council of the EU. Let me say a few words about the key conclusions I draw from my mission to the EU starting in, on 24th of November 2020 and that closed on 29th of January of this year. Um, the purpose of the mission was really to assess the efforts of the EU to combat poverty, and I was struck in my mission by the openness of my interlocutors, including Commissioner Nicola Schmidt, whom we just heard, and Pascal Donoghue, the Minister of Finance of Ireland, President of the Eurogroup, and I was really impressed by their willingness to engage. I think we also were all impressed by the reactivity of the EU to the COVID-19 pandemic. Many taboos have fallen, the rules on state aid were relaxed, the general escape clause to the Stability and Growth Pact was activated, for the first time, the EU will be authorized to borrow on the international markets on behalf of the 27 member states to finance next generation EU, in particular, the recovery and resilience facility for 750 billion uh, euros. Now, these are very important achievements. However, I would like to express two concerns. The first concern is that the structural factors that create obstacles to the fight against poverty at member state level have not been addressed. We still face an, a union in which there is social competition between the EU, in which some member states believe that they could improve their external cost competitiveness by limiting the increase of wages and social contributions from employers. And as a result, we have some 9 million working poor in the EU, largely as a result of the increase in non-standard forms of employment, zero-hour contracts, mini-jobs, workers of the platform gig economy. And that is why the proposal for a new directive on adequate minimum wage presented on 28th of October 2020 is so important. Secondly, we still have fiscal competition between states, a race to the bottom that is organized in the area of taxation on corporate income in particular. That is why the average corporate income tax in the EU has been decreasing by 11% over the past 20 years, despite the existence of a code of conduct on business taxation since 1997 and the work of the European Code of Conduct Group to monitor compliance. The EU, of course, has not remained inactive on this front. It has adopted anti-tax avoidance directives, an agreement was found on 25th of February of this year on a country-by-country -country reporting for large multinational enterprises. However, the principle according to which competition between states has positive impacts justifying the unanimity rule for fiscal harmonization in the EU, this principle remains unchallenged. Thirdly, we have the Stability and Growth Pact and the Treaty on Stability, Coordination and Governance of 2012 that imposed to maintain public deficits under control and to control the public debt. And that remains formally in force, although no distinction is made in this system between, on the one hand, social investment, which creates the conditions for future inclusive growth, and, on the other hand, other expenses. And I think that deserves a very profound revision that I hope in the post-recovery period we will be able to make. My second proviso concerns the role of social rights in the EU integrating process. That role of social rights remains quite marginal. First, there is a strong imbalance between civil and political rights on the one hand and economic, social and cultural rights on the other hand in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, which only includes social rights to the extent they are not considered as purely programmatic and which following its adaptation to allow its insertion in the treaties with the Treaty of Lisbon, distinguishes between rights that can be directly invoked before courts and principles which can only be invoked against certain measures or to guide the interpretation of other measures under Article 52, Paragraph 5 of the Charter. The European Pillar of Social Rights is important, but it is not a substitute for this imbalance. The European Pillar of Social Rights is a political program, a guide for legislative action, 
it is not a set of rights of entitlements which may be invoked before courts. And may, let me take one very clear example. Principle 14 is on minimum income, and it states everyone lacking sufficient resources has the right to adequate minimum income benefits, ensuring a life in dignity at all stages of life, and effective access to enabling goods and services. However, despite the demand of civil society and despite there being a legal basis for this, the Commission proposes today in its action plan to implement the European Pillar of Social Rights, nothing more than a new council recommendation, a non-binding instrument, uh, in order to implement this promise of Principle 14 of the European Pillar. A third example of this imbalance between rights is that there is no systematic impact assessment on poverty or on social rights of the EU policies or legislation, of the National Recovery and Resilience Plans filed under the Recovery and Resilience Facility, or indeed of the Memoranda of Understanding concluded with countries benefiting from support from the European Stability Mechanism. Despite the commitment made in 2014 when the Commission of Jean-Claude Juncker took office to ensure that greater attention should be paid, and I quote, to the social fairness of new macroeconomic adjustment programs to ensure that the adjustment is spread equitably and to protect the most vulnerable in society. That promise has not been kept. Fourth, in the EU's law and policy making, occasional references are made to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, to the Com Convention on the Rights of the Child, and indeed to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which the EU is a party of. However, very few references are made to Council of Europe instruments in the field of social rights, the European Social Charter, and hardly any reference at all is made to the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Although this could facilitate the search for consensus in the EU across the member states on certain important topics, such as the adequate minimum wage, such as minimum income schemes. References to the European Social Charter and to the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights could strengthen the credibility of the EU in its international relations as it imposes itself compliance with standards that it seeks to have imposed on others. It could also avoid creating a situation in which member states are imposed conflicting obligations respectively under EU law or as a result of their membership in the EU and under international human rights law. Remember, for example, that under the European Social Charter, the reform of the Swedish labor legislation that followed the Laval judgment of the European Court of Justice in 2007 resulted in a finding from the European Committee of Social Rights that Sweden was in violation of the European Social Charter. And we have a number of cases concerning Greece in which the economic reforms adopted by Greece following the bailouts of 2010 and 2012 were considered to be in violation with the European Social Charter, for example, with respect to access to youth, to employment, or to the level of pensions. Now, this is why the high-level group of experts on social rights, appointed by the Secretary General of the Council of Europe, that I had the honor of chairing, recommended that a process be launched towards the EU's accession to the European Social Charter, as recommended many times by the European Parliament. This was endorsed very recently on 22nd of April by the Secretary General of the Council of Europe in her proposals to improve the implementation of social rights in Europe in advance of the Berlin Ministerial Meeting of the Council of Europe on 21st of May. The accession of the EU to the European Social Charter is listed among the four priority issues that a conference of the parties to the European Social Charter should be addressing in 2022 or 2023. Let me conclude by saying that the EU can be proud of the standards of living achieved on the continent and of the welfare systems that the member states have developed. But we still have 92 million people in Europe that are at risk of poverty or social exclusion. 19 million children, 23% of children in Europe are still at risk of poverty. 
and neither the social economic framework of the EU and its macroeconomic tools such as the European semester, nor the current tools developed to guide the economic recovery are grounded in social rights as rights with the elements of participation, accountability and entitlements that this entails. Enormous goodwill is expressed and there is a genuine desire to move forward. I am therefore optimistic that we shall see further progress on this front. We can and we must do better for Europeans. Many thanks indeed.